I'm Joe Hume. I'm Director of Community Relations here at the library. I'm, I'm very happy to see you all in our festive uh, ceiling here. That is from the dance party, learning how to do the Charleston that was here on Friday night. So I hope they leave these up for a while. It looks kind of nice in here like this. Um, we're having another Westport Reads year. You know we're reading The Great Gatsby. And this year, Westport Reads is sponsored by Jerry A. Tishman. And I want to remind you also about another event this Thursday night at 7.30 when we had jazz historian Todd Brian Weeks, who is a Staples graduate, now lives in the city and does a lot of historical work on jazz. And he will be here to examine the music of the 20s. Uh, he will play it and give, show you videos of the people playing it. So that's Thursday night at 7.30. And I saw a lot of you are already entering the drawing so that uh, you can hopefully be one of the 20 lucky people who gets to go to the house where Scott and Zelda spent their honeymoon here in Westport. Um, and there'll be a talk by Staples English teacher, uh, Jerry Coriglian, many of you know him, and he will lead a talk and there'll be some polite refreshments. So, Prohibition was the culmination of the reformers' quest and it had as much to do with politics, economics, and geography as it did with alcohol. And as we know, although the sale of alcohol became illegal, alcoholic drinks were still widely available at speakeasies and other underground drinking establishments. And I've learned in the past few years that my great-grandmother was a bootlegger in Stanford. <laughs> Um, so our speaker this evening, Eric Burns, calls drinking the first national pastime. And in his book, The Spirits of America, he talks about the transformation of alcohol from virtue to vice and back again, and how it was thought of as both a scourge and a medicine. Eric is the former host of Fox News Watch and a veteran of NBC Nightly News, and today he has written on matters of media and popular culture for many newspapers and magazines, among them the New York Post, Los Angeles Times, and the Huffington Post. He is also the author of several books, including The Spirits of America and The Smoke of the Gods, A Social History of Tobacco. So I'll ask you, are you feeling a little thirsty? Well, you might be since we are just two days shy of, the nine, of 93 years ago, when Prohibition began, January 16, 1920. That was the day that the 18th Amendment went into effect. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Burns. Joan, I'd like to congratulate you on your lineage. <laughs> All right, here's the circumstantial case you can make from being up here and looking around the room. I would say 80% women, 75% women. Scary. No, it's not scary, but it does suggest that there's an unusual interest on the part of women in alcohol. <laughs> and you, you do understand, you ladies, that nothing's being served tonight. Right? <laughs> It was a gift from the gods. That is what our earliest ancestors thought about alcohol. And the reason is that alcohol altered their consciousness. Uh, it did so in such a way that made them think only God, only God or the gods could do this. And by altering our consciousness in this way, we are brought closer to the gods, our ancestors. Again, very distant ancestors thought that when they were um, uh, inebriated, that they were in a sanctified state. Uh, not only were they closer to the gods, but the gods were able to speak to them more clearly. Of course, they should have known better. When you're truly sanctified, you don't wake up with a hangover. <laughs> Nonetheless, that's how it started. The foundation of human reaction to beer and wine and whiskey. But let's move ahead from alcohol's earliest days to its most popular days and ask a few questions. 
What size is that going to be? I'm sorry, that's not one of the questions. <laughs> well, I just the answer is 60 inches. 60 inches. All right, I just couldn't help it. I'm sorry. Why did Bostonians organize their tea party at the Green Dragon Tavern? Why did Samuel Adams plan his acts of rebellion against the British, including the Boston Massacre at the Black Horse Tavern? Why was Buckman's Tavern in Lexington, Massachusetts, the meeting place for the Minutemen? Why did the New York merchants plan a boycott of British goods in response to the Stamp Act at Burns's Tavern on Broadway? And why did Thomas Jefferson begin writing the Declaration of Independence at the Indian Queen Tavern in Philadelphia with a glass of wine at his side? Answer? Because alcohol was to the Founding Fathers what a Starbucks latte is <laughs> to our generation. Here is an unofficial and I, I, I emphasize unofficial, unofficial drinking schedule of an average columnist in colonial America. Okay, 6.30 a.m., they wake up, many Americans drink some rum or brandy. It's the first thing they do, it's the equivalent of taking a cold shower. It gets their juices going, it gets them ready for the day, it gets them ready for seven o'clock, which is when they have their breakfast and have some more rum, or they pour the rum over the bacon that they're frying as it fries. Yes, rum-soaked bacon. That's 6, 30, 7, 11. They took a four-hour break, 11 a.m. Americans take a uh, break from their labors as well and stop on the job for some booze. After all, as I said, it had been four hours. At lunchtime, another hour later, Americans downed a cocktail called a rum flip with their meal, or they might have a bombo, a rattle skull, or a whistle belly, the latter made with sour beer and breadcrumbs. Four o'clock. This was the afternoon. Uh, version of the 11 o'clock bitters, and in Portland, Maine, these times were so important that they were branded into the day by the town hall bells, which rang daily at 11 and daily at 4, so no one would forget. And no one would have anyhow. 6 o'clock, supper time. The beverage of choice might be beer, cider, wine, or a fermented pear juice called Perry. Eight o'clock, the men pay a visit to their local taverns. The talk invariably turns to revolution. Alcoholic beverages fuel the anger at British behavior. Eleven o'clock, to warm themselves against nocturnal chills before turning in for the night, our forebears drink a hotchpotch which was rum, beer, and sugar served hot. Another day in colonial America. <laughs> and believe it or not, booze was served at school, for it was thought 300 years ago that alcoholic beverages would toughen a young boy or girl. Just the ability to drink that stuff would automatically make a child stronger. doesn't work on kids today, does it? <laughs> In 1755, a 23-year-old uh, man, a landowner and a soldier in the French and Indian Wars named George Washington, decided to run for elected office, uh, a seat in the Virginia Assembly. He lost. The reason, he thought, was that he had been outspent by his opponent. His opponent had bought more booze for voters than he had. It would not happen again. Two years later, in 1757, Washington told his campaign manager that he was not to spend with, quote, too sparing a hand, end of quote. And he 
didn't. He saw to it that 144 gallons of rum, punch, cider, wine, and beer were available to ease a voter's thirst before he went into the polling place and made his choice for the Virginia Assembly. The choice was George Washington. He won by 68 votes. All right, enough examples. Time now for uh, uh, a couple of explanations. Why was there so much drinking in colonial America? A time when, after all, this country was manufactured this country was made, this country was created out of two of the greatest documents in the history of government. And yet it was created by people who could not stay away from alcoholic beverages. Well, one reason was that most other beverages of the time were not safe. Water, for instance, was the worst thing you could drink. There was animal waste in water, there was human waste in water, uh, there was dirt in water. Coffee. Coffee beans were hard to get, and if you got them and ground them, you still had to mix them with water. Tea also had to be mixed with water, and there was another problem with tea, a symbolic problem. Tea was what the British drank. And so, as I said, symbolically, it was something that Americans, the American colonists, did not want to drink. Milk. Obviously, milk was not pasteurized back then, and the hands that pumped the udders were usually dirty. The buckets into which the milk flowed were usually dirty. So alcoholic beverages were believed to be the most sanitary beverages of the time. Not only that, they were believed to be medicinal. The following was written in colonial times by an unknown person about the health benefits of alcohol. <clears throat> Wish me luck getting through this. Here is what alcohol, it was believed in colonial times, would do for you. It sloweth age, it strengtheneth youth, it helpeth digestion, it cutteth phlegm, it abandoneth melancholy, it lighteneth the mind, it quickeneth the spirits, it strengtheneth the hydropsy. It healeth the strangury. It pounceth the stone. It expelleth the gravel. It puffeth away ventrosities. It keepeth and preserveth the head from whirling, the eyes from dazzling, the tongue from lisping, the mouth from snaffling, the teeth from chattering, and the throat from rattling. It keepeth the weasen from stifling, the stomach from wambling, and the heart from swelling. It keepeth the hands from shivering, the sinews from shrinking, the veins from crumbling, the bones from aching, and the marrow from soaking." End of quote. If you had a cold, you were given rum-soaked cherries. If you had a bruise, a piece of cloth was dipped into some alcoholic beverage and it was put on your body where the bruise was. Just imagine if somebody had decided that alcoholic beverages could cure erectile dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> Early in the 19th century, people formed temperance societies to try to get Americans to drink less. And as the century progressed, those societies became more and more intemperate in their methods, radical in their actions. For instance, some of them, and these societies were exclusively made up of women, some of them would pray saloons shut. What they would do is gather in a large group in front of a saloon in the dust and dirt of a colonial town, and they would pray out loud men would walk down the, the, the sidewalk to go into the saloon for a drink, and they would see this group of, of women, and they would feel so embarrassed, especially since you know, their wives might be there, their daughters might be there, their mothers might be there. They'd feel so embarrassed, they'd just turn around and go home. And the women, feeling proud, would move on to the next saloon, 
which meant that the first saloon didn't have any women in front of it, and the people who wanted to drink could go back. That was the problem. There was uh, uh, a lot more. There were a lot more saloons than there were groups of women praying to shut them. And then along came one woman who did the work of dozens, and a couple of bulldozers as well. Carrie Amelia Nation believed that she was born to carry a nation for temperance. She was further motivated in this belief by having married a man to, who drank himself to death after they had been married for but six months and impregnated her with a child who was very severely handicapped, more than likely because of the husband's condition. And Carrie, by herself, cared for this child for her, Carrie's, entire life. Further adding to the dysfunctionality of the family was the fact that although they lived in Garrard County, Kentucky, Carrie's mother was convinced she was Queen Victoria. <coughs> as far as I know, she had no evidence to believe this. But her husband, for some reason, indulged her. And so every morning, she would dress in purple robes, and she had a crystal and cut glass tiara. She would get into the wagon, her husband would drive her, and she would cover her lands, saying hello to the peons who were working for her. They would look at her and, of course, think she was drunk. Carrie dressed differently from her mother, however, much more simply. She dressed in plain black. She was six feet tall. She looked like an avenging angel. She brandished a hatchet, and as such, she was a sight to strike fear into the hearts of the hardiest of tipplers. Smash, smash, for Jesus' sake, smash, she would holler. And at that point, she would go to work. I quote here from the Spirits of America, she scattered customers, battered tables, slivered bars, shredded glasses, decapitated stools, pulverized windows, bashed in gas lights, launched ashtrays into suborbital flight, and in one place, absolutely enraged, tore down a sign that said, All nations welcome, but carry. <laughs> She was a member of the most famous temperance society of the time, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. But the members of that group didn't quite know what to make about her. They were very genteel. Carrie was a middle linebacker. So they were pleased with the benefits that accrued to their purposes from Carrie's actions, but a little embarrassed about those actions themselves. Even so, as extreme as she was, as hard as she tried, she was not able to carry a nation for temperance. The job was just too big, and as the years went by and she kept trying, she became the parody of herself, describing herself as, quote, a bulldog running along at the feet of Jesus, barking what he, at what he doesn't like, end of quote. She published a couple of newsletters and a comically self-serving autobiography. Then she sold autographed pictures of herself, posing with a hatchet in her hand. But posing is all it was. The, the, the pictures were staged. She wasn't really doing any damage. Uh, she was scowling, standing there with a hatchet. Afterwards, she started selling little lapel pins of hatchets. Actually, they were just little hatchets, and she would say to people, they make great lapel pins, you should buy them for this reason. If there had been, if there had been a home shopping network <laughs> at that time, Carrie Nation would have been one of its stars. <coughs> Such a shame. She wasn't a laughingstock, as we like to think. She was a tortured woman who believed in her cause. But here is the problem with the cause. There never, 
ever was a time in this country, never, when a majority of people wanted alcoholic beverages, the manufacture and distribution of them, to be illegal. Prohibition, or to put it more officially, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, and this is a very important point, was the first great example in American history of minority rule. The most solid piece of evidence yet presented that a Republican form of government, as envisioned by the Founding Fathers, wouldn't work and hasn't worked since. As lobbyists and other vested interest groups have corrupted the democratic process by purchasing votes on behalf of those who seek either money or more power or <coughs> seek the advancement of their cause. The will of the public be damned. Are there and have there been exceptions to this? Of course. But the exceptions aside, the minority rule rules. And it all started on a grand scale in this country with the Anti-Saloon League, the ASL, which was headed by a man who only looked mousy. Wayne Wheeler and his minions persuaded factory owners to vote for prohibition because a sober workforce would be a more productive workforce. They persuaded the clergy to vote for prohibition because a sober congregation would be more receptive to the word of God. And they persuaded politicians to vote for prohibition because, well actually, let me tell you what Wayne Wheeler had to say about that. These are his words. I do it the way the political bosses do it, with minorities. There are some anti-saloon votes in every community. I and the other speakers increase the number and passion of them. I list and bind them to vote as I bid. I say, we'll all vote against the men in office who won't support our bills. We'll vote for candidates who will promise to. They'll break their promise, sure. Next time, we'll break them. And we can, we did, our swinging solid minorities, no matter how small, counted. End of quote. Well, Wheeler was right. His swinging solid minorities did count. And I'll tell you what else counted ingeniously. It was the name of the group, the Anti-Saloon League. Believe it or not, a lot of people joined, not knowing exactly what its purpose was in almost every community the most disreputable building, whether you were a drinker or not, was the saloon. It smelled bad. It wasn't clean. The language used was offensive. The behavior was often lewd. If you wanted it to be more lewd, you could pay a few dollars, go upstairs, and lie down on a bed whose sheets hadn't been changed for a month. No one, no one wanted a saloon his or her community. Those who drank wanted to drink in nice restaurants, in nice taverns. They wanted to drink at home. So many of them not paying strict attention to what the anti-saloon leagues, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Agenda. <laughs> well, agenda would do. That's, no, that's not what I was looking for, but since I'm stuck, I'll take it. Not paying attention to what the agenda really was, they signed up in the membership for the Anti-Saloon League, got very big. Politicians were thereby influenced falsely to think it was more powerful than it really was. But of course, the Anti-Saloon League didn't just want to get rid of saloons. It wanted to get rid of the beverage that was served in saloons. Did it succeed? Well, of course not. Wayne Wheeler and company failed. Well, they got the law they wanted but they never had a chance to get the obedience that they wanted. When the so-called Great War, World War I, started, several states in the Midwest had already passed prohibitory laws because the grains that were used to make beer and whiskey could now be used 
used better to make foodstuffs for our troops. In addition, there were a few other states in the Midwest who, because of the influence of the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, had voted to go dry. They wanted to get a head start on the foolishness that would soon infect the entire country. But prohibition, with a capital P, the 18th Amendment did not become the law of the land until 12.01 a.m. on January 16, 1920. At approximately 12.02 a.m. on January 16, 1920, Americans started breaking the law. The result of this was that although the 18th Amendment did not create organized crime, which a lot of people think, what it did was provide the venture capital for organized crime to grow, to grow so much that even after Prohibition ended, it was still an immensely lucrative enterprise. And the result of this was that organized crime turned more violent than it ever had before. After all, there was so much money to be made. It's probably fair to say that during Prohibition, organized crime grew more rapidly, more ruthlessly, and more ominously than Standard Oil, the Ford Motor Company, and United States Steel put together. But we're getting ahead of our story here. One of the ways that Americans started breaking the law at 12.02 a.m. on January 16, 1920, was by making alcoholic beverages at home. Here is a poem from the time that gives you an idea of how some people did it. Mothers in the kitchen washing out the jug. Sisters in the pantry, bottling the suds. Fathers in the cellar, mixing up the hops. Johnny's on the front porch, watching for the cops. <laughs> it is estimated that during the almost 14 years of national prohibition, Americans produced as much as 700 million gallons of beer at home. And who knows how many bathtubs full of bathtub gin. There was also, by the way, um, a, a way in which you could produce ersatz wine at home. Uh, I didn't include it here because I was concerned about time. But if we do have time uh, in the Q&A and you're interested, um, do ask. Is that somebody who had an answer for... No? Okay. okay. Another way that Americans broke the law was by going to speakeasies, which were the most plentiful of Prohibition-era businesses. These were bars that were able to operate because they were A, well disguised as restaurants or tailor shops, or even, in Detroit, a funeral home, which brought the booze in using hearses. Never had a dead person. Not once. Hearses full of boots. Or B, because the speakeasies had so munificently bribed the cops on the beat. A couple of fifties, a couple of shots, the cops looked the other way. And speakeasies served the best liquor you could get in prohibition, pure, unadulterated, just like the old times, imported from Canada, or in some cases, actually cases, from the British Isles. But the prices were two, three, four times as much as they had been before. Prohibition was the greatest seller's market this country has ever known. But what I'm talking about here are the high-class speakeasies. Customers who could afford to pay two, three, or four times as much as they used to pay. Unfortunately, there were also low-class speakeasies, or even worse, the lower-class crooks who sold bottles of booze, the kinds of people who we today call street people, who would sell bottles of booze to other street people people who could not even afford the low-class joints. For them, for these customers, 
Alcoholic beverages meant illness at best, disease, disfigurement, and death at worst. The first step for the merchants who sold this kind of liquor was to buy the good stuff and then cut it. The tools of the cutter's trade, as I wrote in my book, The Spirits of America, quote, were water, flavorings, and alcohol. The water increased the quantities of the beverage. The uh, flavorings restored the diluted mixture to something approximating the original taste. And the alcohol replaced the lost pizzazz. The problem was that the alcohol was usually pure poison. It might be industrial alcohol. It might be rubbing alcohol. It might be iodine, insecticides, engine fuels, brake fluids, methanol, or cleaning products. But some people were so desperate for a drink during Prohibition that they bought this stuff anyhow, knowing full well what was in it, what it might do to them. One woman in Atlanta was arrested for public drunkenness, for imbibing the inconceivable mixture of mothballs and gasoline. During a single four-day period in 1928, 34 people in New York died from unwittingly drinking straight wood alcohol, otherwise known as a coroner's cocktail. Jackass brandy was made from peaches and some form of alcohol. We don't know what it is. But one glass caused internal bleeding. Sweet whiskey, with a nice harmless name like that, was a combination of nitric and sulfuric acids, and it destroyed the kidneys. And Jamaica gin. Jamaica gin, 90% alcohol, 180 proof, caused paralysis of the hands and feet. Drink too much of it and you had a limp for life. You had Jake foot. You were called a Jake stepper or Jake trotter. The author, Ethan Morden, estimates that by 1927, quote, the death toll from the imbibing of liquor containing poisoned alcohol stood at 11,700, end of quote. Now, to me, that figure seems high. And although it's not popular among historians to do this, we have to consider the other side of the story, the number of lives saved by prohibition. How many? Well, we don't know. But a lot of people, the, the take it or leave it kind of drinker decided that alcohol was either too expensive, too hard to get, too hard to make, or too dangerous to consume. He or she decided it was easier just not to bother with. As a result, fewer people died from such diseases as cirrhosis of the liver. We know this from hospital records of the time. There were also fewer hospital admissions due to alcohol-related violence. There were fewer accidents in the workplace and on the highways because of drunken or hungover workers and drivers. And let me quote from a study of the period done some years later. It's a little dry, but bear with me. It's important. In 1943, Forrest, Linder, and Robert Grove compiled mortality figures for the Census Bureau in a publication called Vital Statistic Rates in the United States. They found that from a high of 7.3 deaths from chronic or acute alcoholism per 100,000 population in 1907, the rate fell gradually, possibly as a result of state prohibitory laws, and war prohibition to 1.6 per 100,000 in 1919, and then to 1.0 in 1920, the first full year that the 18th Amendment was in effect. 
The rates then climbed slowly again, probably reflecting the gradual increase in illegal and often poisonous liquors supplies, peaking at 4.0 per 100,000 in 1927, although in 1932, which was the last full year of prohibition, the figure was down once again to 2.5. End of quote. So, what they found out is that in 1907, with virtually no prohibition, no prohibition anywhere in this country, 7.3 out of every 100,000 Americans died of alcohol poisoning. At its worst, at its very worst, during prohibition, four people out of every 100,000 died. And after that, the number dropped to two and a half. Prohibition, then, did not prohibit. It did, however, reduce. Or as Winston Churchill paraphrased a friend who had visited the United States during the dry days, there is less drinking, but there is worse drinking. The so-called noble experiment, which is what prohibition was called, ended after 13 years, 10 months, and 19 days, on December 5th, 1933, at 3.32 p.m., Utah became the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. President Franklin Roosevelt is said to have had a drink in honor of the occasion. And Henry Louis Mangan, the most brilliantly perverse journalist of his time, who had opposed prohibition vehemently from start to finish, marked the occasion by summoning reporters and photographers to his favorite drinking place. Drinking a glass of water all the way down in one gulp, wiping his mouth, then looking at the reporters and saying, that's the first one of those I've had in 13 years. <laughs> One final note, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution is the only constitutional amendment ever to have been repealed. It is a distinction appropriate to its absurdity. And now I'm repealing myself. That's the end of my formal presentation. A toast to you for your attentiveness, <laughs> and I would be happy to answer any questions. You know, it's great. Just I, uh, uh, this I didn't do this. I don't think. But speakers, have you noticed that when speakers finish speaking, to try to encourage or let the audience know that it's time to applaud, they say thank you. They say thank you before anything has happened. Before there's anything to say thank you. For. I try not to do that. Thank you for getting it started. And you had a question. Yes, I was curious about our early American times. What would have been the alcoholic content? Do we know? No. Okay, or we don't know. Did they actually drink in terms of ounces or what? Three hours, four hours a day, did drink? Um, no. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's some figures that I could throw at you, but they're they're they are uh, uh, contested. And, and that's really the big question, is what was the alcohol content? The, the best guess is that it was pretty close to what it was today. You know, there are certain people, maybe you know some, who, who drink too much, but seem to have built up a resistance, and you can't tell how much they've drunk. This doesn't work for everybody. It certainly didn't work for my father. But it works for some people. And apparently it worked for a lot of people, because I, I know <coughs> Tom Brokaw said the greatest generation was the World War II fighters. To me, the greatest generation was the Founding Fathers. And they were also the generation that drank more than any Americans ever have before or since. It's inexplicable. Uh, the 
troops in the American Revolution, our Americans. Yeah, the uh, sailors in particular had a rum ration daily. Yeah, and then once we got to uh, World War II, cigarettes. Cigarettes became a, a, a very valuable form of currency. You could get a chick for a night with a couple of cigarettes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. You didn't mention anything about going to the doctor and getting a prescription for uh, alcoholic medicine. I know I had a bottle which one of my teenage kids long ago happened to empty, but it was from a pharmacy in Norwalk, and it was a doctor's prescription, and it was whiskey of some sort. Yeah, that's really annoying that you said that, because um, there, there is a lot that I wasn't able to fit in, and that's part of it. That, that was done very little, actually. But if you had, yes, if you had a pharmacist who would write a prescription for you, there were, the government allowed, uh, for instance, industrial alcohol, which you didn't want to get a prescription for, to be made, because it was necessary. Industrial alcohol was necessary. There were certain kinds of, of, of safer beverages that doctors believed were, were uh, helpful in certain uh, occasions, often colds, brandy, for instance, for colds. So you could get a pharmacist to write you a prescription. Uh, most pharmacists were rather ethical about it because they were afraid of the law, and if a doctor would suggest one bottle, he would generally write a prescription for one bottle. Yes? What was the Prohibition on Native Americans who, who understand. Have I have no idea. <laughs> in all the research, isn't that interesting? In all the research that I've done for this topic, I have never seen a single reference to Native Americans. Maybe it'll be your next book. Well, but perhaps they, uh, always, they always made, always made their own uh, beverages. And well, they certainly always made their own laws. Uh, but still, if, if they wanted what wasn't around, uh, they were going to have the same difficulty that others were. Uh, but I have never seen a word mentioned about uh, Native Americans. Somebody ask me something that I know, please. <laughs> I, I Make wanna, this easy, okay? <laughs> Come on, Aaron. I just want to know if I've got this right. This is my opinion. Your books are re readable, reliable, and rewarding with three R's. Okay? You smile. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> and that's what I have to say about your books. Uh, what does your book look like? All the authors we've had here recently have brought their books with them, that, you know, to sell their books. Well, this is a different occasion. This isn't about the book. This is this is about The Great Gatsby, and, and, and you know, Prohibition had a role in The Great Gatsby, so uh, I wasn't going to turn this into a commercial occasion. Well, you're to be commended for that, but just describe the cover for me or something, so when I go for Barnes & Noble, I can find it. Uh, it was back. published in 2004. So if you go to Barnes and Noble, um, they'll get it for you. Oh, they'll get it for you. Yeah. But you'll live there before you see it on the shelf, and you can get it from Amazon. It's still available. But books that are uh, eight, almost nine years old, are not on shelves anymore. I usually ask the authors that come here their work habits, and I know some of yours, but I would have you describe how you go about preparing to write and how you actually write. And and tell us about your wife, please. I know she's not here, but I know she's a beautiful woman, and I'd like to hear about her, at least hear about her. I'm not going to tell you about my wife. And my work habits are appalling. What I do is I get up, I, I put my robe on, I put my slippers on, uh, I have a problem with my hair in the morning because my hair is thin, so it does this. And I commute to work dressed like that. My commute is about six or seven seconds. Uh, I go to the library that I have in my house. 
I just start working. I make sure that I've ended the day before in a place where I know what I'm doing. I'm in the middle of something. Um, I've uh, called Debbie Celia, who uh, works for the Westport Library, uh, part time and for me full time. Or did I get that? Did I get, did I get Maybe I got that the day the way around. I don't know. But Debbie has loaded me up with what I need for the day. I have quite a few books, quite a quite a bit of material online. Um, I try to get original documents whenever I can. But um, I like to work early in the morning because um, no one has called yet. Um, and, you know, not, the, the day's activities haven't intruded yet. There's just peacefulness and stillness. I appreciate your uh, reliability in regards to the documentation. There is a lot of material being hyped today that has questionable background. Uh, it's not authenticated in regards to notes or archives or whatever. And I appreciate what you do. You're very careful about that. And I, I, I have everyone know that. Uh, because there's a lot of stuff that's not great if you look at the reliability of what they're telling you. You know what's, I just thought this was very funny. I was on uh, Rachel Maddow's program several years ago talking about this. A, a, uh, uh, and I'm sorry if you're a conservative, it doesn't matter. A real scumbucket named Edward Klein wrote a book. Uh, this is the one I think that uh, he's trashed everybody, uh, but this is before Obama. This is the one about uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and what a horrible person Hillary Clinton was. Okay, this has nothing to do with politics. You look at the back of a book. And uh, I often, when I find something interesting, I will go to the uh, 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 bibliography to see, you know, where this information was gotten, because I'm thinking maybe this is what I want to get myself. Uh, the first 13, I still remember the number, the first 13 items in the bibliography of Edward Klein's uh, hatchet job on Hillary Clinton, 11 of them were Klein's last book. <laughs> <laughs> He was citing his own last book as sources for his information. Yes, sir. Sir, I have two questions. All right. You have the 18th and 19th Amendment, and there was a Volstead Act. Yes. Which one was the Volstead Act? I always get confused. Neither. The Volstead Act uh, was the, the prohibition arm of the 18th Amendment. It was what laid down the penalties for uh, breaking the law that was the 18th Amendment. So when you had the 19th Amendment, the Volstead Act was abrogated? Yes. Yes. Second, what is the origin of the term speakeasy? Um, Mencken, who, as you know, perhaps wrote a book called The American Language, which uh, is still regarded as one of the great studies of, uh, of, of, of the language in this country, thinks that it comes from an Irish term that means speak softly. Um, there are other people who think that it was uh, 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 a, a term that came about during Prohibition itself uh, because there was a, a, a fear that if you talk too loud, loudly, I should say, um, somebody outside might hear you. In other words, no one knows, but several people have some educated guesses. Like, did you, would you just cool it? I'm trying, I'm All trying, right. but this is so interesting. Yes, sir. Was there any part of the country or generally parts of the country where the prohibition was more effective than others, like cities as opposed to the country? Or uh, you know what's interesting? It tended to be more effective in the Midwest at the in the beginning. Um, because uh, of stronger religious beliefs, because the Midwest was the power center, so to speak. Evanston, Illinois was for the Women's Christian Temperance Union. But one of the things that farmers didn't realize was that if prohibition succeeded, they were out of business. Who was going to buy the wheat? No one. I mean, yes, there are other uses for wheat. Corn, rice. Barley, oats, when uh, about two or three years before uh, Prohibition ended, there was a 
uh, senator whose no name I, I don't remember right now, but um, who continually was introducing legislation. He was from the Farm Belt to get um, prohibition rescinded when the strongest votes, that is to say the states that voted with the highest percentages in favor of prohibition, uh, these were the states that now most desperately wanted it to end. Mm -hmm. Yes? Now, um, do you have any information on what did they drink? I mean, did they mostly drink wine? Did they mostly drink what they made in the bathtub? Or uh, Coca-Cola and ginger ale, Canada Dry ginger ale sales were up enormously. Grapefruit juice sales increased enormously. Uh, those were the grapefruit, I, I never would have guessed, but those were the three beverages whose sales <coughs> increased the most. No, but I meant like what alcohol before prohibition, what did they mostly drink wine, did they mostly drink spirits, oh, beer? Oh, I, I really don't know. I'm not sure anybody's ever tried to figure that out. Um, I'm just curious. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that was the form. That was not the original. Um, okay. Let's have some Coca Cola. And <laughs> see where we end up. Kind of go. No, you had a question. Yes, sir. Um, on your research and preparing for your speech tonight, did you or, and or writing the book, did you could you shed any light um, on prohibition and Long Island and Westport in this particular area? Did you do any research for that? particular neighborhood? No, I didn't. When I, actually, when I did the book, um, I didn't live here. And uh, no, there's nothing I can tell you specifically. And uh, no reason to think that there was anything different here than there was any place else. But I don't know. I know where one of the main speakies the main One of the main speakies is I did some, because I was curious. You did some drinking there? No. No, I did. I'm not old enough. Um, one of the main speakeasies in Westport was underneath the Westport Bank and Trust. That was one of the key speakeasies in the town. Now, the reason I found out was I was very curious what was there before the Westport, I'm a historian by profession, what was there before the Westport Bank and Trust? Westport Bank and Trust, I think, was back in 1923, something like that. And before that, I found out, thanks to the Westport Library, they found me some articles, that it was the main, there were other speakeasies mm -hmm. in Westport, but it was the main speakeasy. And that um, was very interesting uh, to, find, to find that little tidbit out. And in the earlier times, uh, I wanted to know what it was even earlier. It was the town water pump. Well, they it's tied, you know how it goes, State Street is straight, and then it dips down where the Y is, it goes down, and then State Street is up higher. They tied the horses up there, and the, the water pump was there, and then they went, went home. So that's what... And that place has had quite a history. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because this was a hotbed for, yep. uh, for, for bootleggers and all. My uncle was a bootlegger, I know yeah. this. My mom didn't say too much about it before she died, but there's still, there is a gun in, a, in, my, in our attic, in my house. Um, I, I didn't touch it, it's in a trunk. But my mother used to talk about it, and she goes, oh yeah, and she talked about he was, um, this was in Fairfield, but he was in cahoots with the police sergeant at the time, and they used to go right over here to Southport Beach and Combo, and it was a, little, it was a real hot bed. But uh, yeah, there's a gun in the act, so of course I had a few I spy, and I, I, I did find it up there, and like, you know, and I just, but I never took it out or anything. But see, that, that wouldn't have been atypical. There were a lot of hotbeds. One of the effects um, that's hard to discuss because it, it can't be quantified, but one of, one of the most deleterious effects of prohibition was the disrespect that it engendered for law generally for the kinds of people who uh, made our laws. I mean, if it, you, know, you, you think you don't have much respect for Congress now. Well, back then, 
I, I mean, this, this, this amendment went completely against human nature. We don't normally pass the laws that go against human nature. But it did so to such an extreme that, that people, people doubted all laws. If, if he, in other words, if, if these people can vote to do this, what might they vote to do next? It, it had a very, very harmful effect. Uh, Joan, we're going to have until uh, 8.30, right? Which is another couple minutes, if anybody has anything. <laughs> no, I just want to talk. There's some local people here, and she brought up... Yeah, but it's okay if I sit. Of course, you're going to sit right here. <laughs> but there's something you, still could, you could still visit. The Penguin Apartments is uh, surrounded by... Uh, Condos and whatever. That was a very famous uh, watering hole. Speaking of Penguin, yeah, the, the main building. And uh, Arcudi's down in Saugatuck. The Ar old Arcudi's family was notorious. They had a restaurant tavern there during Prohibition. You had to be able to knock on the door, certainly. Sturgis Inn, beautiful <coughs> home up on Sturgis Highway, was extremely well known. It was a gay bar during Prohibition, and it's a beautiful home and whatever, but it's a nice, quiet place to sneak away to and drink and do some other things, maybe. Compo Inn burned to the yeah. ground. Oh, I was going to say, I didn't want you to forget the Compo Inn. Compo Inn burned to the ground. Very famous story as to what went on at Compo Inn. I mean, it wasn't just drinking, and it wasn't just dancing, and it wasn't just whatever you want to say. Was that over the bridge? Or was well, it's, on the, the it's the corner the of um, Ludlow Road. And the post road right opposite King's Highway School. Yeah. yeah, that's what the old compound. They used to have this incredible Main clock was one there. that he stood out on the post road. This mm -hmm. neon clock. How do, how do you play solo here? A great deal of difficulty. I have a rule. You like my rule? Meet three new people every day in your life. What? I do it by starting these insane conversations. <laughs> yeah. Final question. Yes. Oh, I, well, um, religious organizations, now, oh, you yeah. know, during services, you are permitted to drink, or, so they had to have to get it from somewhere. Yes, one of the, one of the many uh, alcoholic beverages that was uh, permitted to be manufactured was uh, uh, wine. Uh, I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe that uh, wine that is used at least, I, I was raised a, a Roman Catholic, um, I believe that that wine is of lesser alcoholic content than most wines are. Uh, it was, I know, during Prohibition. Um, but yes, you're right, that's one way. There were, there were quite a few uh, examples <coughs> of exceptions, but um, they were all small, and churches, churches could only get it is now 8.30. Very Before small ones. <laughs> well, that's it. Just, if I'm being interrupted. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.